okay, let's start, it's 1400. Um, so, welcome to this uh, next talk about some uh, retro uh, hardware. Uh, you might have noticed it in the uh, retro gaming area. It was a machine with a transparent uh, case uh, and it's a replica of the machine we are actually talking about right now, the Galaxia. And with me is uh, Thomas Scholz. He is presenting all the details of his replica and the original machine. So, have fun. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, again, my, my name is Tomas Schulz. I am an electrical engineer. I am a free software developer. I come from Ljubljana and I'm a member of the Slovenian hackerspace Kiberpipa. I'm also a volunteer for the Slovenian Computer History Museum. And in the next 45 minutes, I would like to tell you everything there is to know about a small microcomputer from the former Yugoslavia called Galaxia. Um, as you probably guessed, guess, um, this talk was inspired by the previous Ultimate talks on the earlier congresses. If you haven't seen the talks about Commodore 64 or Atari 2600, um, I recommend you check them out. They're really great. Um, so, I guess before I start talking about uh, Galaxia, I can't skip some historical background. Uh, as you're probably aware, in the 1980s, in the Western Europe at least, the whole microcomputer revolution was happening. New small computers using cheap microprocessors were getting increasingly popular. Uh, I'm talking about machines, for instance, from Sinclair, ZX-81, or Spectrum, or uh, Commodore 64, to name just a few. Unfortunately, the situation in Yugoslavia was a bit different at the time. Uh, the regime made it almost impossible for individuals to buy Western computers. Now, if you lived in the north of the country, this was not actually such a big problem. You drove to Austria or Italy, the borders were not well enforced. You bought a computer there, hide it under the seat of your car, uh, drive back, and you had a pretty good chance of not getting caught. Uh, Actually, this was such a popular practice that one of the first um, computer games in, made in Slovenia was a text adventure on how to smuggle computers over the border. <laughs> uh, now, if you lived further south, this, was, this practice was getting a bit difficult. You had further to drive. You also had internal borders to worry about. And so maybe knowing this, it might surprise you that Yugoslavia at that time had a teaming electronics industry. They were making uh, mainframes, they were making workstations for businesses, for government, they were making their own semiconductors and what components they could not make themselves, they imported from the West. There's a, there's a ton of interesting stories how they managed to do that, but maybe that's topic for another time. Um, so the availability of electronic components was not actually a problem. And in fact, several attempts were made by the domestic industry to make microcomputers that would um, mimic the pop popular computers in the West. Uh, unfortunately, many of these attempts, if they managed to um, come further from the drawing board, they were usually much too expensive to, for common people to buy. And so this is kind of the environment where this gentleman, gentleman on the right here, Mr. Voj Antonic, uh, designed Galaxia in 1983 in Belgrade. Uh, he envisioned a small do-it-yourself computer that anyone with a bit of soldering experience could build at home. It had to be as simple as possible. It had to contain minimal number of components and most importantly, minimal number of components that had to be imported from the West since those were the most expensive ones. Uh, so this is how Mr. Antonich looks like today. Uh, Galaxia means galaxy in English and was named after a monthly popular science magazine of the same name where it was first described. Uh, this happened thanks to this gentleman, Mr. Dejan Listanovic, which was who was an editor of the magazine at the time. He arranged for a special edition of the magazine published in 1984, uh, in January 1984, where Galaxia was completely described. Uh, assembly instructions were given, schematics, PCB artwork, uh, user's manual, and an offer was given for a kit for sale, which included the um, most hard to um, 
by components like the mechanical keyboard and the CPU and the ROMs that contain the Galaxy S operating system. Uh, you, could, you also had an uh, option of making everything yourself and uh, you could just send empty EEPROMs to the authors by mail and they would program it with the operating system for free and send it back to you via mail. Uh, so, since Galaxia started as a do-it-yourself computer, many, uh, each one looks a bit different. Many ended up in wooden cases like this one. Uh, at the start, when the article was published, it was predicted that perhaps a few hundreds would be made by hobbyists. And in the end, the count of all the ROMs shipped via mail uh, ended up around 8,000. So, it was a much larger response than expected. Later on, the industry also picked up on Galaxia success. They started making them on the production lines. Uh, this is one, one example of how it looks like. This is a bit different one. Many of them ended up in elementary schools. And in fact, today, it's not even known how many were made. Um, even not the original authors were not notified of production numbers. And while it's most certain that these numbers are not in any way comparable with popular machines in the West, um, it's certain that Galaxia is, was the most popular uh, domestic microcomputer in Yugoslavia in 1980s. Uh, if, you, if you look under the case, this is how a bit messier do-it-yourself version looked like. Uh, you had a sim single layer PCB, through hole components for easy assembly. This is a bit cleaner version made professionally. Uh, if we look at what we have on the board here, there's a Zilog Z80 CPU running at 3 megahertz. This is a CPU you would also find in the uh, contemporary Sinclair computers. There's space for two 4 kilobytes ROM, ROMs. Um, the first socket ROM A is usually populated with the uh, Galaxia's operating system and the second socket usually with the first official extension of that. Uh, there's six kilobytes of static RAM on board. There's a character generator ROM which contains the uh, character set Galaxia is able to display on the screen. There's a special hardware register that's called Latch in the original documentation. There are also 13 other general purpose, low scale integration, digital circuits in the low power shot kit technology. Um, so I'm talking about end, end gates, OR gates, um, shift registers and so on. And together with a handful of analog components, this is a complete working microcomputer. If you look at what we have at the back, there's a five volt DC power supply input. You have a analog audio tape input and output for retrieving and saving data from audio cassette tapes as this was the usual mass storage device at the time. For video output, you either had an option of using a radio frequency output, which you could connect to your television's uh, antenna connector, or if you have, happen to have a monitor that was capable of uh, displaying composite video, which was quite rare at the time, uh, you also had an option of using that. And there's an expansion connector, which as it was common practice at, at the time, just exposes the CPU bus. Okay, so this is how uh, the screen looks like when uh, the Galaxia boots up. You get a command prompt. Uh, this is a Hello World program in the built-in basic interpreter. Uh, to load a program from cassette tape, you type in old, start and press enter, start the tape. When the loading finishes, you get the command prompt back, type run and the program runs. Uh, so this is the original schematic that was published in Galaxia magazine. And I guess it's time to um, dive into the details. Uh, so first, let's look at the CPU. Uh, the Z80 CPU is an 8-bit architecture, which means you get a 16-bit address bus capable of addressing 64 kilobytes of memory. You get an 8-bit data bus. You actually have two separate address spaces, uh, 64 kilobytes address space for memory and 64 kilobytes uh, memory uh, address space for I.O., which is completely unused on Galaxia and available for any extensions on the extension port. This is what you get inside the CPU. There's an 8-bit accumulator register, which is capable of performing uh, most of the arithmetic and logic operations the CPU supports. There's an 8-bit status register. You had three 16-bit general purpose registers, which can also be in, uh, used as six 8-bit registers. 
you get two 16-bit index registers, uh, one 16-bit stack pointer, and two special purpose 8-bit registers, I and R, which I will uh, describe in a few moments. You also get a secondary register bank, which you can exchange with the primary register bank in with this fast single byte instruction. This is very useful to um, implement fast interrupt response routines since you do not need to push the CPU state on the stack. Uh, so CPU instructions um, consist of one or more machine cycles. Uh, all, all instructions start with machine cycle M1 in which the CPU fetches the uh, instruction opcode from the memory and instructions can then have additional memory access uh, cycles as needed. Machine, cycle is, the machine cycles are divided in further into T cycles. Uh, this is the CPU clock, the 3 megahertz clock in um, Galaxia, for instance. In detail, how the M1 cycle looks like. Um, at the second clock cycle, uh, the CPU puts a program counter on the address bus and reads a byte from the, so the opcode byte from the data bus. Uh, and on the third and fourth clock cycles, uh, the contents of the I and R register are put on the, on the address bus. The CPU actually does not use the result of this memory read operation. Uh, this was a feature intended to, to refresh dynamic memories as uh, the CPU automatically increments the lower seven bits of the R register. Uh, this is so the in this way the CPU reads out consecutive memory locations from um, from RAM uh, one location per executed instruction and this is can be used to refresh dynamic memories but Galaxy uses a static memory and this feature is actually used to produce video signal as we'll see later. Uh, this is the uh, main page of instruction for the Z80. You, you get uh, 252 single byte instructions. You get four instruction prefixes for two byte instructions and two of those prefixes have a further prefix for three byte instructions. Um, okay, so the CPU has a single interrupt line, uh, maskable interrupt line. Uh, when, this line when this line goes high, the CPU finishes executing the last uh, CPU instruction and after that enters a special uh, interrupt response M1 cycle. Uh, this cycle can actually be arbitrarily lengthened by inserting wait states using a wait signal. Uh, this is actually important if you want to achieve accurate synchronization of the interrupt routine. Uh, and Galaxia uses that to achieve synchronization between the video driver code and the electron beam on the TV as we'll see later. Uh, why is this important? Because you, you cannot know in advance how long the execution of the last instruction will take. Uh, there's an interesting feature in original Galaxia circuit here. Uh, it depends on the relative timings of do, these two transitions, so low to high M1 and low to high IO request lines. Um, this is not actually specified by the Z80 uh, data sheet and it turns out that er early CPUs actually honor these timings. Uh, while newer ones usually have these two transitions much too close together for um, the original Galaxia circuit to work. So new CPUs will not work with old, with original Galaxias, or most of them at least won't work. So that's uh, good to know if your CPU burns out. Um, okay, so during the interrupt response cycle, uh, the CPU reads out a single byte on the data bus. Uh, how this byte is interpreted depends on a software selectable interrupt mode. In interrupt mode zero, this byte is interpreted as a uh, opcode, which the CPU then executes in the next machine cycle. Uh, this is not actually useful on Galaxia since it lacks any hardware that would put meaningful data on the data bus there. Um, in interrupt mode one, this byte is ignored and the CPU always executes a restart on address 38 hex, and this is the default mode Galaxy operates in. This address is mapped to ROM, ROM and there's a, um, some built-in interrupt routine there. Um, there's a, a third interrupt mode in which that byte is interpreted as a index into a jump table, and this can be useful if you want to hijack the interrupt on Galaxia to, for, inst for instance, to um, run your own code. You only have to sacrifice 256 bytes to um, have a dummy jump table because you cannot predict what the index will be there. 
Ah, okay. So finished. We finished with the CPU. Let's look at what how the Galaxy generates video signal. That's the what majority of the hardware there is actually dedicated to. Uh, this is how the TV screen looks like. It's divided into the usable image area and the sync and overscan area. Uh, Galaxia uses a PAL system, which means you get 50 frames per second. Um, the electron beam scans the screen from top to bottom, left to right. Uh, you get 56 lines on the top overscan area. You get 208 lines in the usable image area, and again at the bottom, fi uh, 56 lines in the overscan area. Uh, the maskable CPU interrupt fires on uh, when the electron beam starts scanning the first scan line of the usable uh, image area. And by default, this starts the video driver in ROM, and the video driver code executes as long as the uh, electron beam is scanning the image area, which means that the CPU is only free to, to execute user code approximately one third of the time. Uh, similarly, as for instance in Z ZX81, you can disable the interrupt, then you have the full attention of the CPU, but um, unless you do some clever tricks, you cannot display anything on the screen at that time. Uh, the CPU runs synchronously with the, with the uh, electron beam. You get thir uh, 32 clock cycles in the leftover scan area, 128 cycles in the image area for its scan line, and, and again 32 uh, clock cycles on the right. The pixel clock is two times the CPU clock, which means you draw two pixels on the screen per one clock cycle. Uh, the built-in video driver divides this area into 16 rows by 32 characters and uses a frame buffer uh, in RAM starting at address 2800 hex. Uh, the character generator ROM contains the characters which are then filled into these character cells. Uh, characters are 8 pixels wide by 16 pixels high. And this data is actually not mapped into the CPU address space. Rather, the part of the ROM address that determines the scan line of the character to be drawn comes from the latch, so the, that a special hardware register um, I mentioned at the start. And the part of the address that determines the character uh, comes directly from the CPU bus. How this? Uh, okay. So, and the output of the ra of the ROM. Um, so the pixel data gets uh, into a shift register, which um, serializes the, serializes it. Uh, if you look how this everything works. Uh, so at the start, the CPU generates consecutive frame buffer addresses using the I and R registers and the dynamic memory refresh feature. Um, these addresses read out bytes from RAM, from the frame buffer area in RAM, so characters to be drawn. Together with the character scan line that has been uh, programmed into the latch, this reads out eight bits, eight bits of pixel data at the time from character ROM. This gets then shift, gets uh, loaded into a shift register which serializes it and um, feeds it into a, some analog circuitry that generates the composite video. Uh, if you look into the timeline, how this works. At the top, we start at uh, the moment the electron beam starts scanning the first scan line on the screen. In the first uh, two clock cycles, um, this is the first half of the M1 cycle. The CPU reads um, an instruction from ROM. This, it's not actually important what this instruction is, as long as it's a single byte instruction that does not do memory accesses. Uh, in this case, for instance, it's increment D, uh, register D. In the second half of the first M1 cycle, uh, this uh, dynamic memory refresh feature gets invoked. Uh, the the I and R registers have been programmed beforehand by the video driver code to point to the, the first character in the frame buffer area at this time. Uh, in this example, this reads out character B, ASCII code for B from the frame buffer. And together with the value in latch, which has also been previously programmed by the video driver code, um, this 
loads up the first scan line of the character B into the shift register. Uh, so the pixel clock is two times the uh, CPU clock, so in the next four clock cycles this gets uh, shifted out uh, by the shift register into the composite video generation circuit on board. Uh, the whole procedure then repeats for the second character, so the R register has been automatically incremented by the CPU and uh, it reads out the next location in the frame buffer and so on until uh, the, whole, the first scan line for the whole uh, row of characters has been drawn. When the electron beam returns to the start on the, for the next scan line, uh, the video driver code has already updated the uh, value in the latch so that the next scan line gets drawn and then the next and so on until we have the complete line of characters. Uh, so if this rings a bell, the ZX81 is, uh, uses almost a um, completely the same uh, routine except that it actually executes the frame buffer contents as code not, and not, it doesn't use the dynamic refresh feature like this. So the character generator ROM uh, contains 64 alphanumeric and punctuation characters. This roughly corresponds to the middle of the ASCII table, except for the Yugoslavian accented characters there at the end and the logo that's displayed on the, on the um, command prompt. You also get 64 pseudo-random characters. Uh, this allow for a kind of a low resolution graphics. Uh, each character is divided uh, to two by three dots and together with the uh, uh, original character resolution you get a low resolution graphics of 64 by 48 dots. Um, so this is kind of a graphics you can expect from Galaxia. This is a port from of a jumping jack game that was originally made for Sinclair Spectrum and this is how it looks on Spectrum. Um, <laughs> Also, of course, Spectrum also has colors. Galaxia has only black and white video. Uh, this is a port of the Tetris game. Uh, <laughs> this is an uh, original adventure game, uh, Inspector Spiridon. Uh, this is a port of a dancing demon game from TRS-80. And if you manage to override the original video driver code, you can get high resolution graphics like this one. Um, you can look, if you look closer here, actually each scan line contains a different pattern of pixels. Uh, this is done uh, with a custom video driver that actually skips scan lines in the character generator ROM. So using this technique you actually can display a different character on each scan line and you're only limited with the frame buffer uh, size because Galaxy only has six kilobytes and you can, you can quickly run out of memory. But on the horizontal line you're always constrained to the combination of pixels you have in the character generator ROM. Okay, that's so much for the video generation part. Uh, let's look at what we have in uh, address space. So at the bottom we have the two ROMs. Above that there's an IO, memory mapped IO area starting at 200 hex. Um, above that there's six kilobytes of RAM and above the RAM, the address space is unused and available for further extensions. In the I.O. area, there's um, a memory mapped keyboard and uh, access to the latch. If we check first the keyboard, uh, each key has its own memory location. They are alphabetically ordered, which greatly simplifies mapping the addresses to ASCII code, which then affects the size of the code in the ROM. If you read a byte from a address associated with the key, you have to look at the low, least significant bit. If it's one, the key has not been pressed. If it's zero, the key has been pressed. Uh, the first column of keys also act, uh, serves as an output of an audio comparator for the cassette audio input. Uh, there's a simple uh, analog comparator there. If the bit is one, there has been silence on the input. If it's zero, it, an impulse has been detected and this can be useful to, this can be used to reconstruct data that has been saved on the tape. Uh, uh, so what's in the latch? Um, latch only implements the high, uh, most significant six bits. So the bottom two bits are not implemented. This address is write only. You um, cannot read out back the values you have programmed in there. 
Uh, so bits 2 through 5, select the character generator ROM, which I already discussed. Bits 2 and 6, uh, control the cassette port output. This implements a simple digital to analog conversion. You get to output three different states, so plus one, zero, minus one. And this, is, this can be used to save modulated data to the tape, or if you happen to connect a speaker, so there's no, no built-in speaker, but you can connect it to that output. And some games use this to produce um, audio. Uh, and the most significant bit is interesting. It performs a address, a RAM address line clamp. So if you write a bit one in there, um, RAM addressing works as usual. If you write a bit zero, uh, RAM chips always see address line seven as one. Uh, if you think about it, this performs a simple memory map operation. If you divide RAM into blocks of 128 bytes, um, writing, bit, uh, writing zero into that bit remaps all the odd blocks to even blocks. Uh, this might sound like useful, useless, why, why would you want to do that? Uh, in fact, it turns out that uh, some of the Z80 CPUs that were in encountered by the Glexias designers did not implement uh, bit 7 in the R register. And actually the ROM code uh, that's active during video refresh uses this latch function to control the bit 7. Um, actually, I haven't seen any modern Z80 that would have this, but apparently it was required at the time. Uh, okay, so now let's, I guess that's all about uh, Galaxia's hardware. Um, let's look at what the operating system contains. Uh, Galaxia's operating system is actually closely connected to this computer. This is the TRS-80. Uh, Glex contents of Galaxia's ROM were developed by Mr. Antonich on a homemade clone of TRS-80 with 64 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, he took the level one basic from TRS-80, disassembled it, uh, adapted it to fit Galaxia's hardware, uh, compiled it back into, an, into the binary that's then programmed into Galaxia's ROM A. Uh, this is how the published disassembly looks like. It's very light on comments uh, because not many comments would actually fit together with the source code into the 64 kilobytes of TRS-80 uh, RAM. Um, so, yeah, by the way, so um, concerning this code, you often can hear a rumor that um, this Galaxia's operating system is based on Microsoft Basic and that some of this code has actually been um, written by Bill Gates. Uh, so while it makes for a funny story, it's, as far as I know, not actually true. Uh, as far as I know, level one basic in TRS-80 had no involvement from Microsoft whatsoever. Um, okay, so what's in ROM A? At the start, we have the zero page, so the first 20, 256 bytes um, of ROM. This contains the reset vectors, so this is where the Z80 will jump to when uh, a maskable or not maskable interrupt happens. Uh, this part of ROM also contains entry points for commonly used Z80 functions because the Z80 has a special single byte restart instruction which um, can be used to perform very efficient jumps into this area. Uh, then below that we have the video driver, which I already discussed. Um, below, uh, majority of the space in ROM is occupied by the basic interpreter. Uh, this is the code, that's uh, location of the code, and there you also have some um, lookup functions. Uh, it's interesting that these lookup functions actually over, overlap with the video driver code. Uh, that's because some of the code there can also be interpreted as uh, ASCII strings to save space. Uh, so what basic interpreter offers? You get a bunch of command line uh, instructions. You can type only on the command line. Uh, these are used to load and save data from the tape. Uh, you also get a simple on-screen editor for the basic programs. 
Then you get a bunch of functions, so um, keywords that will return a value and some more procedures, keywords that will not return a value. Uh, you might notice that there are also some uh, flow control primitives there, that's because those are actually implemented in the basic as um, normal basic procedures. Uh, you only get three error messages back. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I believe that, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so what means uh, there should be a parsing error, how invalid argument, and sorry, uh, it ran out of space. Uh, the basic interpreter is actually extendable. Uh, you get a, video, a basic link system variable at this address at the, at the uh, RAM where you can point it to additional lookup tables and you can add additional uh, functions, uh, procedures, uh, functionality of the basic interpreter. Uh, in addition to basic interpreter, there's a, a simple terminal emulation. Uh, it recognizes some basic ASCII control codes. You also can redirect the terminal output to arbitrary device. There's a, again a hook in the system area of RAM where you can point it to your own function and you can then um, send it to printer or, or whatever other device there is. Uh, the, video, the t terminal emulation also um, tweaks a bit the video timing so you get a s uh, fancy smooth scroll animation when the terminal scro scrolls up. Uh, okay, there's also a stack based floating point uh, calculator which again um, overlaps a bit with the video driver there. Uh, for any floating point geeks here, there's a, uh, the Galaxy uses a 23-bit Mantissa 8-bit um, exponent floating point format. It actually uses two different um, floating point formats. The 40-bit extended format is used for performing calculations because that's easier to do. And for storing values into RAM, it uses a compressed 32-bit format. Uh, RAM also contains some keyboard driver uh, functions and lookup tables to map scan codes into ASCII uh, characters. Uh, there's an audio cassette driver for loading and uh, saving data. And in the end, you get at least uh, exactly one spare byte, and uh, that's quite amazing if you look at it. Uh, okay, so what about RAM? Uh, at the start of the RAM, you have the system area. Uh, most of the system area is occupied by the frame buffer, which I already mentioned. It's 512 bytes. Below that, there's space for 26 basic variables, so floating point variables for each um, letter in the alphabet, and two string variables uh, with the maximum length of 16 bytes. Uh, you also get the arithmetic stack for the floating point calculator, and the same area is occupied by the CPU stack, which grows in the other direction. There's also some general purpose buffer that's used by the basic interpreter, and this leaves you with around five kilobytes of RAM left for user uh, space. In the user space, this is how things are usually divided. Uh, so this part starts at 2C3A hex. Uh, at, the, at the top, we usually have a machine code program, if any, if, the, if your program actually uses machine code. Uh, below that, there's a basic program, which is pointed to by two system variables, uh, basic start and basic end, and this program grows downwards. And on the other end of the RAM, we have a uh, numerical array for basic and a string array for basic, and these two grow upwards in the other direction. Uh, some other useful memory addresses that uh, come in handy when programming Galaxia. Since Galaxia uses software to produce video signal, you um, can affect the position of the screen by poking two system variables. Uh, so you can affect the horizontal and vertical position using, if you write to these two um, memory addresses, 2BA8 and 2BB0 hex. Uh, start and end of the basic program I already mentioned. There are two um, system variables that take care of that. And if you intend to use assembly, um, you have to take care about the IX register. This is solely um, 
used to, as a stack pointer for the floating point calculator. Uh, so if you, if you want to use any ROM routines in your assembly program, you have to take care not to modify that. Uh, same goes from, for the IY register. This is used as a um, interrupt hook. Uh, so if you point it to your own uh, assembly routine, you, it will get exec executed 50 times per second just after the screen has been refreshed by the video driver. Okay, finally, uh, let's look at the, uh, how Galaxia stores data on the tape. Uh, this is the modulation that's used. It's very simple. A single pulse encodes a bit zero. Two pulses encode a bit one. Uh, this gives you a kind of a slow modulation of 300 bits per second. So if you're familiar with, for instance, Sinclair Spectrum uses frequency shift keying, which gives you around a, a 1,500 bytes per second. Um, so this might at first sound slow, but if you think that Galaxy only has six kilobytes of RAM to work with, it's not actually such a um, big problem. But on the other hand, Decoding this only takes like 200 bytes in ROM, so that was the um, and that was the decision that was made by the by the programs. What's actually stored uh, on the tape? Each tape block starts with a sync byte that's um, always A5. Below that, there's a 16-bit start address and 16-bit um, end address, all in um, Little Endian, since that 80 is Little Endian architecture. That is followed by the actual data to be loaded, and in the end, the, a checksum. And you have to take care that the sum of all bytes, including the checksum byte, um, ends up um, FF hex. So, if you think about it, this is how um, this gives you a general mechanism of overwriting arbitrary locations in the uh, CPU address space from the tape. So, how usually Galaxia's programs use this. Um, this is also the way uh, ROM code will store data on the tape. Uh, so the majority of the data will get loaded, of course, into the user space, uh, starting at 2C3A. But um, the data will start loading four bytes before the start of the user space. Uh, it will override these two system variables, basic start and basic end, and they will, it will set them so that they point into the user space uh, to the location of the basic program that was loaded there. Now, Galaxia has an intentional feature that when you load pro, uh, data uh, from the tape using ROM routines, it will always return back to the command prompt. This was um, kind of an intentional feature for um, anti-copyright pro copy protection um, because uh, the authors wanted programs to be shared. So when you loaded a program in from the tape, you could always um, save it back to another tape instead of running. Um, so this is kind of a different um, difference from other machines like that, which will give you a um, option of starting a program automatically as soon as it's loaded. Of course, um, it didn't take long for people to figure out how to circumvent the anti-copy protection feature. Um, what you usually encounter with programs like this is they start loading data even a bit further into the system area. They overwrite the video link pointer. If you remember, this is the terminal redirection uh, pointer. They change this pointer so that it points to some, user, some code they loaded into the user space. And when Galaxia finishes loading data, uh, it will attempt to print the command prompt. The calls to the terminal uh, emulation layer will get redirected into the user code, and then that code can do whatever it wants. It can usually some some people use this to uh, have custom loaders for for. Um, faster loads and stuff like that. Uh, but it's not very common. Okay, let's talk about upgrades. Um, I already mentioned the first official upgrade. Um, the ROM B added a Z80 assembler and development tools. Uh, this made Galaxia later very popular as a development environment for embedded Z80 uh, systems. Uh, 
It also added mathematical, additional mathematical functions uh, uh, and some basic ex additional basic extensions, which mostly dealt with hardware that you could connect to the extension port at the back. Uh, there was also a Galaxia Plus. This was actually released a few years after the original. Uh, it added a high resolution, true gra high resolution graphics mode, uh, dedicated audio hardware, uh, I think 48 kilobytes of RAM, uh, but it was not actually popular and you c today you will uh, very rarely encounter one. So if you want to play with Galaxia today, um, the easier way to start is to get an emulator. There's an emulator for Windows, there's an emulator for DOS, there's an emulator for Sinclair Spectrum, <laughs> and there's an emulator for Sam Coupe if you happen to have one of these around. Um, actually, none of these emulators are, are cycle exact, so they will only run software that depends on the built-in ROM uh, video driver. If, if programs mess with the video timings, like the demo I showed before, uh, this will not usually work correctly. Uh, for that, you need a hardware implementation, at least until somebody creates a, a better emulator. Um, hint. <laughs> um, the, so the simplest hardware implementation is a micro Galaxia. This one puts everything on a single FPGA chip, the Z80 core, all the, all the memory and all the logic. Uh, there's a PLD implementation. This one um, keeps a separate CPU and uh, memory, but implements some of the logic in, in a programmable logic device. And there's a CMOS implementation, the one you could see above in the, um, on the Congress in the retro gaming area. And this one retains all the, the nature of the original in having all the logic in discrete, in discrete chips. Um, for the cost of one additional uh, logic chip, it also logic chip it also fixes the Z80 timing issues I mentioned at the, at the start. So this one will actually work with any Z80 you will uh, find these days. Uh, okay, so now we want to develop software for Galaxia. Uh, the basic tool is an assembly. If you of course want to go further than just basic, which is quite limited. Um, there's also uh, this assembler. This assembler also comes very handy. Um, the Z88 development kit contains a C compiler, which has been ported to Galaxia, so we can now also write code in C and compile it there. And of course, if you intend to to do to program um, develop programs for Galaxia on a PC, um, these Galaxia development tools come very handy. They allow you to emulate the cassette. Um, player through your PC sound card, so you can conveniently transfer code and data uh, between your PC and Galaxia. Uh, further information about Gal uh, Galaxia and hardware there, uh, the Z80, home of the Z80 CPU contains all information about the CPU you ever wanted and more probably. Um, there's an incomplete ROM disassembly available on the net, which is pretty complete at this point. Uh, there's a collection of original software uh, which you can load into the emulators or, the, or some hardware implementation. Uh, if you happen to speak one of the languages from former Yugoslavia, um, you can get a ton of original magazine scans um, uh, that cover all aspects of Galaxia. And if you happen to speak English, then um, I, over the time I published many blog posts about various minor details of the original Galaxia circuits on my blog. Uh, and yeah, there's also a forum, which unfortunately is not very active these days, but it's worth mentioning. So that kind of concludes my presentation. I hope I managed to satisfy your curiosity about Galaxia and Yeah, thank you very much. If you jump up and enjoy and have a question, please head over to the two microphones. Which some people might want to do. 
Yeah, we start. We, uh, do we have any questions from the internet, by the way? No questions from the internet. <laughs> then, well, go ahead. Okay. Hvala uh, mnogo, vrlo dobro je bio. The software that was used, you mentioned a lot of games and a lot of techniques that were used for gaming development. Was there any sort of office or production software that was in common use? Um, not that I know of. There's a lot of software in that collection which has an unknown purpose and without documentation and stuff like that. Um, Galaxia has been popular with the amateur radio community also. There's some software there that I, I guessed it had to do with some um, amateur radio stuff, but I, documentation is often lacking, so um, you get code, you don't know what it does. <laughs> Thank you. Go over there. Oh, hi, yeah. Uh, you mentioned the pixel clock, it's double the CPU speed. Yeah. Um, how is that achieved? It's, um... So there's a clock tree. Um, you generate a six. 6144 kilohertz clock with the crystal and then that's divided down by 2 to 3000 so um, 3000 what 72 uh, kilohertz clock for the CPU and that, that gets further divided down to get um, timings for the vertical sync and horizontal sync um, okay and uh, overclocking the CPU is and not really successful, I guess? Or? Um, the problem here is that the CPU must run synchronously with the um, electron beam. So if you, if you overclock the CPU, you will get more than 50 frames per second, and TVs won't um, actually um, display anything there. Okay. It's, it's a normal composite video signal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's the original, the original Galaxia actually had some weird features in that signal that um, modern LCD TVs won't display properly. Uh -huh. uh, that CMOS um, replica I made uh, fixes that so you can plug it into a modern TV and that works. Okay, thanks. Hi, I wonder if there was any usage for built-in board systems. Um, so is there a software for it or are, is there a serial interface in any kind? Um, there has, I, there was an article published on how to how to control a modem through Galaxia. So there was some usage of that, but I'm not familiar how extensive that was. I I I I, I, I remember an article that had a picture of this acoustic coupler next to Galaxia. I I don't really remember um, what um, if there was were any BBCs or something mentioned. Uh, you said there were memory regions both used as code and strings. Can you say something more about that? Yes, so um, if you recall when I was discussing the video driver, how the video driver code works, um, the, it's not actually important what the CPU executes during the, while, the, while the electron beam is scanning the, the scan line. Uh, it's only important that the instruction is a single byte instruction with no memory accesses. And it turns out you have space for 32 single byte instructions for while the electron beam is scanning the scan line. And this give, leaves you plenty of space to perform operations you need to do so that you can um, so that you can prepare everything when the electron beam scans back to the next scan line. And there's also some space left for instructions that don't need to have any purpose. And those were actually used as ASCII strings. So uh, in the, uh, if you look at the disassembled code, it actually uh, adds ASCII strings there and then corrects whatever damage those, th that, that code does um, to the register and stuff like this. Thank you. Hi, I have a bit different question. Uh, I come from Croatia and uh, this is great, but I've never heard of this computer before. So since you work at the museum, maybe you could tell me more about the modern reception in states of former Yugoslavia, in formal education and in popular culture maybe. Why is it not that famous? Hmm. Um, so actually, I don't know how to answer that. Um, it's so. In 
Slovenia actually it was not uh, where I'm from it's not actually the Galaxia was not actually that popular because people rather um, got a Spectrum Mars Commodore um, I, I happen to recall that some of some of the Galaxias I, I've seen Galaxias in elementary school mm -hmm. um, so why they are not so well known today uh, I personally first um, first kind of got interest in Galaxia when we got one uh, to our museum Mm -hmm. And that was, I don't know, a few years back, so... Yeah, it was just, you know, interesting because, well, now we, we hear lots of uh, popular culture from Yugoslavia, you know, music and everything like that, and uh, I know computers are not that popular, but this, is re this would really be popular if people knew. So, so there's the a, best. the computer museum in Croatia, in, um, in Rijeka, the pick and poke one, they have, they have a few galaxies there, they're happy yes. to discuss that. Uh, I'm, as I said, I... Uh... Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, I don't see any more questions, then uh, another warm welcome of applause for Tika Komas. <laughs> <laughs>